Okay, guys, we're going to finish up our discussion on the Tree of Life. Those of you that have been here um, the last few weeks, we've been talking really about a paradigm or a way that we view Christianity. Um, if you'd like to, you can go to our website and watch the last couple weeks on our uh, homepage. Um, I'd encourage you to do so if you haven't. Uh, those of you who have been with us, you know that um, what we're talking about essentially is swimming against the current of American Christianity. How many of you guys know that Jesus did not die on the cross for all of our sins so that we could do our little two days a week at church and punch in our religious time cards? Uh, but somehow that's what it's become to us, especially here in America. It's become sort of uh, our duty to follow God uh, here in America. And a lot of us treat following the Lord like homework. You know what I'm talking about? Where Jesus becomes homework, and he never intended for us to be homework, or for him to be homework to us. In fact, the word tells us that he came to give us life, life fuller, and more abundantly. And here's a good way I like to describe abundance. Uh, I love Thanksgiving time. How many of you guys love Thanksgiving? I mean, here it is, June, I'm already thinking about the bird in November. <laughs> I love Thanksgiving, and I love all of what's left after Thanksgiving. Can I get an amen? amen? Well, that's some good preaching right there. Touch two people and say, love some turkey. You didn't know you were going to get Pentecostal today over uh, Thanksgiving. So, love to have turkey, right? We love uh, turkey, and all of us kind of do the same thing. As we get a turkey, and we wonder, is it going to be enough? And at the end of our meal, it looks like we didn't even touch the turkey because there's a whole bird left. And so the abundance is that you have turkey sandwiches for the next two weeks or so. As long as you can keep that bird good, you're eating it for the next several weeks, right? And I remember as a kid, I didn't appreciate that though because we would have turkey sandwiches, we'd have turkey cereal in the morning, we'd have, you name it, turkey everything. I'm just joking, we didn't have turkey cereal. My mom's like, shut up! An abundance of turkey, it lasts far beyond the need. That's God's intention for you. That His Spirit, His life, and all that He's done for us would last far beyond your need. And our need is salvation, right? Uh, we, if you look in Genesis chapter 3, you find the account of Adam and Eve falling into sin. As sin is introduced in the world, the repercussion of it is that we are removed from a face-to-face -face relationship with God, which was His natural intention all along. How many of you know that God's intent and design for man is that he would spend every day face-to-face -face having friendship and relationship with him? It was his plan, it was his desire, but because of sin, it separated us from God. And so what we've been doing is taking a look first at what happens through sin and the fall of man, the repercussion of it, and also looking at God's intention for us and how we should live. Because... What Jesus does on the cross is brings restoration to each and every one of us. So though we may not physically with our eyes look upon him until the day, amen? amen? Until then, he still has yet provided an opportunity for us to have a face-to-face -face relationship with him. To have intimacy, to have closeness. And many of us have sold ourselves short because we've bought into a religious paradigm. And in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, you find in the... In, Genesis 3, there's a tree in the middle of the garden, and the Lord had told them you can eat of all the trees, of all the fruit-bearing trees in the garden, you can eat of any of them. 
For the exception of the one in the middle of the garden, he told them that the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will, sh you will surely die. And so the serpent comes, which was the enemy, was Lucifer, Satan, he comes and he deceives Eve. He takes her to the tree and they see that the tree looked good. You find that in the scripture. The tree looked good. How many of us know that not every sin looks horrific to us? In fact, a lot of it is very attractive. And one of the things, ironically, that's very attractive to us is a religious paradigm. It makes us feel good about us. It makes us feel good about what we're doing. It justifies because we can use a, a set standard of measurement, whichever that happens to be. Generally, it's whatever your parents trained you with when you were a child. Or maybe you went to Bible college, or maybe you just learned uh, things when you went to university after high school, or maybe it's just what you've learned on the streets to the University of Hard Knocks. But we all develop a paradigm, a worldview of how we see things. And in that paradigm, we've determined what we know to be good and what we know to be evil. And we can justify ourselves based upon that really floating scale, right? Um, I know that what my parents taught me to be good, and so if I follow that, I can justify myself as being a good person. How many of you guys have ever gone to a funeral and people gather to speak about the person and they say, she was just such a wonderful person. He was just such an amazing guy. But we've been talking that in Matthew chapter 7, there's going to be an encounter that each and every one of us will have. Jesus forewarns us in Matthew 7 that one day we will be standing before him and we'll be making justification. Lord, I did this in your name. I prayed for the sick and they were healed. I preached the gospel. I laid hands on people who were demon-possessed. God. And he's going to look and say, don't know you. Sorry. How do we ensure that we're not those people? Well, I believe the first step, not the only step, not the only thing we need, but the first step is to identify the false system that makes us feel good about us. And I believe that there are many Americans that have bought into a false paradigm, a false religion, a false Christianity, and they have their faith tied into a date where they walked down an aisle one day, or maybe if you're a part of a denomination, you tie your faith to a certain uh, day that you were baptized. And many of us, on that day when we stand before the Lord, we'll say, but hey, Lord, uh, June 23rd, 1973, or 1982, or 1990, or whatever, we're going to quote a date to him and say, I was baptized, open the gates, let me come in. And he'll say, I don't know you. How do we ensure to not be those people? Well, it's to clearly identify the wrong or the false religion, a false paradigm. You know that in the end times, if you look in Matthew uh, 24, you find that Jesus begins to talk about what the end times look like. And he begins to describe a generation, the final and last generation. And I want to encourage you, when you get a chance, to read it because it sounds a lot like our generation today. And in the last generation preceding the coming, the returning of the Lord, you find that there is a massive falling away of the body of Christ from Jesus. They become offended and they fall away. I believe this is erotism. I'm going to be clear about that. This is my belief in this. That it's going to be all the people that have bought into a false paradigm of Christianity. That have bought into a false belief system of what Christianity looks like. People that have gone to camp meetings and bought and subscribed to the theology that God wants you to have big giant houses and a bunch of great cars and have all this great stuff. Well, when you enter into an age where you're not allowed to buy or sell without a mark of the beast and you choose not to, guess what happens? All gone. That paradigm of Christianity becomes null and void. That, that theology cannot stand to the coming of the day the day of the coming of the Lord Jesus. That becomes my issue with that theology. It can't stand to the last day. Jesus tells his disciples right from the get-go, Bobby, come here a second. I picture Jesus doing this. I don't see Jesus walking around like some of us have this idea that Jesus floated everywhere he went. Right? <laughs> and there was a halo and he just... But I think that Jesus did this. I think he had his buddies who were fishermen and he went like this. Dude, I'm so glad you're with me. I'm going to send you out there. And good news, I'm sending you like sheep among wolves. 
Yes! Awesome! Go! And I bet you they did exactly that. Whoa! Oh, you can sit down. Thanks. They had that, uh, say what? So we get an understanding from the very beginning that Jesus has a different paradigm than what the American church does. Because he's saying that unless you take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me, you're not worthy of me. He's telling us that we have to be grafted in into the vine because he's the vine, we're the branches. And so in this doctrine of the tree of life, we, we discover that there is life and there is innocence in the tree of life. But in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there is a system of what's good and what's evil. And no matter how much you ingest of the goodness of that tree, the outcome is exactly the same, death. So many of us that have committed our lives to what I refer to as the American Christianity, and we've invested ourselves into it, and we've followed every single step that the American church has given to us, and we look good, and we look justified, and maybe we're deacons at our church, or we're whatever, and we've committed ourselves to being right, but we may just be dead right. And Jesus' criticism to the Pharisees was that you clean the outside of the cup. All right? How many of you guys enjoyed your coffee today? How many of you guys bothered to actually look on the inside of your cup? Because there was one of them that they pulled out of the trash and I just left it in there. So I'm just kidding. I didn't. Just a joke. But we've been trained. Oh, it looks good because we see the outside. Right? And we look at people, our friends. In fact, many of us, that's why we get uh, ensnared into the keeping up with the Joneses mentality because we want everyone to perceive us a certain way. And Jesus' criticism to the Pharisees was that you haven't paid attention to the inside of the cup. And the Lord makes it clear. Do you remember when uh, Samuel was choosing the next king to be anointed? Ultimately, it was the king that God had originally ordained to lead God's people. But it was the people that mandated, we want a king now. We want one right now. And they got Saul. But the Lord had one chosen. It was David. And when they called all the brothers in from the fields, all of Jesse's sons, uh, they didn't even bother bringing David in. He was just this young kid, shepherd boy. And uh, he looks at all the sons, and the Lord's like, yeah, it's none of them. And so you could imagine being there where... Uh, Samuel is this amazing prophet of God, and he's looking at these guys that the Lord told him, I'm going to anoint one of these guys king, and he's going, hmm, do you have another son by chance? Because none of them. Well, yeah, it's David, but I mean, surely you don't want David, right? So they bring David, and as David comes in, immediately the Lord says, he's the one. And he anoints David as the next king. And that's when we discover Man looks on the outside, but God looks upon the heart. And so the, the word instructs us, guard your heart, right? Because from it flow the issues of life. Jeremiah tells us that your heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The Lord searches the heart and knows us. And so those of us that have bought into this American ideology of Christianity and we feel good and justified about ourselves because we've done our very best to live by our heart of hearts, your heart's deceitfully wicked. So what we have to learn is how to follow Jesus through what the scriptures teach and tell us. This is why I believe this doctrine is so vital to the American church. It's a 180. It's the antithesis of what everyone else is doing. Everybody else is doing as much as they can to look right, to appear to be justified. You get into church services and they're standing and waving hankies and saying amen, but brother so-and-so is in an adulterous relationship with someone else, standing up waving their hanky saying, praise God. In the church they look really great. I want to talk to the issues in the heart. This is what Jesus dealt with. And so I have really just two scriptures for us to look at as we close this out. We reviewed this last week, John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Say true. true. One more time. True. You must infer, you see an inference here. You've got to deduce that if Jesus is making a claim here, I'm the true vine, 
we must accept the fact that then there must be false minds. If he's the true one, there must be an antithesis to that. There must be something opposite to it. There must be something familiar to it. But all of them are false because the only one true one is Jesus. And Jesus makes the claim clear throughout all the Gospels. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, say no one, no, no one comes to the Father but through me. It says, I am the true vine, my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because you have the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. How many of you guys have discovered that? Alright? Uh, you, you love nice fresh oranges? You can't just lop off a branch of an orange tree and take it home and get your own oranges. It doesn't work that way. It must be connected to the source of life. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If, anything, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Verse 7, listen to this. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. There is a massive monumental promise given to us to those who will abide in Christ. Are you trekking with me? This becomes a fundamental flaw in much of the American doctrine. Where we have people walking around saying, I pray this in the name of Jesus, amen, it's going to be done. And I claim it done is so. And then nothing changes. Ha, ah, you're not plugged in. Doesn't work. All of us have laptops. But those batteries will run dry. And what has to happen? You must be plugged in. Got to be plugged in. We have to be in full submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Remaining underneath His leadership. So Jesus says this. Last week I encouraged you guys that if you really want to get an idea of what it's like to live in the tree of life, to walk and remain abiding in Him, I suggest that you read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. This is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not just highlighting a few nice personality cues that are great. He's pointing out what it looks like to be a Christ follower. What it is to be a disciple of Christ. It's not somebody who is born with a certain personality trait and they inherit these certain values. And because of the value they've got, they'll get this reward. That's not what he's saying. What he's telling everybody is this is my expectation of the church. This is how every Christian lives. We don't have even close to the kind of time we can uh, uh, would need to go over any of that. But I do want to highlight one thing. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, or beginning in verse 16, Jesus says this. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so... Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, therefore, by their fruits you will know them. By their what? Fruits. How do you know an apple tree is an apple tree? One more time. Duh. Right? How do you know an orange tree? Same answer, guys. Let me help you out. How do you know an apple tree? How do you know an orange tree? How do you know pears? Right? We don't have to be all... I think that's a pear. Sure. Go try that. Go try that. Is that a pear? No, goofball, it's a pear. You can see it. Right? But man, isn't that how every one of us treat Christianity? Huh? Oh, I'm 
pretty sure I'm saved. I prayed a prayer in 1978. Huh? Oh, I was, I was baptized June 13th. That's like claiming to be an apple and you're quite vividly, obviously an orange. Right? Jesus is saying something really valuable here for us, that we would be known by our fruit. And so this doctrine of the tree of life goes far deeper than just resistance to religion. It's choosing on one end to say no to what religion feeds us and purposing to live with the Scripture's mandate. Not because it's homework and not because we're uh, forced to, but because it's a choice. We choose to. We've chosen to follow Jesus Christ. We've chosen to make Him Lord of our lives and submit to His leadership. Huge, fantastic difference between the two. And so our fruit is on the trees so that people can identify who we are. Think about that. Jesus talks about that in chapter 6, where we have the light of him living within us, but yet so many of us cover it. Oh, you know, if I talked about Jesus in my workplace, they would fire me. So I just do it silently. Yet you engage in all of the gossip going on in the office. You engage in passing all the emails about so-and-so. They gather around, they're talking about people, and you're right there in the midst of it. Keeping it nice and silent so they don't know you're saved. Bold statement alert. Ready? Grab your chair. Here we go. Bold statement. You ever heard, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, must be a duck? If your fruit does not look like Jesus, you might not be saved. Oh, did he really just say that? Oh. I did. Because I'm more concerned about your Matthew 7 experience than I am what you think of me today. No. I'm concerned about the people that have been part of our church that have gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, it becomes a sobering experience as a pastor when you checked in a few and you wonder, man, I wonder if I gave them some bad doctrine and if they've got shocked at the gates. It becomes very sobering as a minister. So I'm more concerned with what's going to happen in your Matthew 7 experience than what you think today. There are thousands of churches just in Thornton. Forget about the whole city of Denver and Colorado. And so if this one offends you, there's a whole bunch of other ones that you might find that would fit you better. But what I'm consumed with is letting people know there's coming a day you will stand before him and I don't want you to feel comfortable in what you've done. Because he tells us there's going to be people who have chosen to live a life praying for the sick and they're healed. Casting out demons and preaching the gospel and yet he doesn't even know them. So don't Invest into your works and what you think you've done. Invest into who you know. You must be plugged in to Jesus. Must be. Must be plugged in. When we're plugged into Jesus, guess what happens? Our heart is broken for the things that break his heart. Our values radically change from our neighbor. Our, rat, our values look different than the people we work with because we're consumed with the values of Jesus. We talk differently because Jesus is our value system. So living in the tree of life is not just refuting the religious paradigm. It's choosing to embrace Jesus. Last couple weeks we said this, you are what you eat. How many of you guys love pizza? Huh? Anybody love ding-dongs and ho-hos? Hallelujah. Huh? Come on, can we stand up and give three cheers? To... Right? You know what's really funny? Is you could actually... In fact, I just... If you will just humor me for a moment. Alright? I want to show you something. Can I do that? And I'm just going to warn you, it might... Be distasteful to you or might hurt your feelings because it's what you appreciate in the American church. But I want to show you something, okay? 
All right. I'm going to make a statement, and after each statement, I want to hear amen, or your word of preference could be hallelujah. Okay? Everybody cool with that? But you need to participate. I need to hear some amens, and you need to hear some hallelujahs. If I say something you really appreciate, I want you to stand up and go, oh, yes. Okay? Can anybody? Are you guys all with me? There's three reactions I'm looking for. Right? I'm looking for an amen, a hallelujah, or a stand up and go, oh, yes. All right? Here we go. Oh, how many of you love a good Twinkie? Oh, yes. How about a good wonderful ho-ho? How many of you love a good burrito from Chubby's? I thought for sure I'd get a stand-up right there. That sounded like a lot of church services, and I wasn't saying a single thing about Jesus. There was nothing edifying our spirit there, and that looks and sounds like a lot of American churches. I'm not trying to pick fun. I'm not trying to be um, degrading, and I'm not trying to make us better than others. I'm simply trying to point out the thought, have you bought into the authenticity of Christ or have you bought into a paradigm of religion? Because the paradigm of religion will convince you you've got the right thing. It's like the kid that grew up and never had real Coca-Cola before. And all you've ever had is Big K. And you drink it, it tastes good. You're, you're convinced that's what Coca-Cola is until the day you actually have a real Coke. Those of you who are looking around, Ryan's not here. It's okay to talk about Coke. How many of you guys catch what I'm saying here? I'm not trying to mock. I'm not trying to, to um, disrespect. I just want us to understand there's an awful lot of things you can do that sound very religious, that sound really good for just a moment there. Had they not heard me say Twinkies or Ho-Hos or Chubby's Burritos, but just the response, boy, I was some good preaching. Huh? How much of what we've bought into is cultural? How much of what we've been following has just been modeled religion? I want to encourage us to get a taste for Jesus, the authenticity of Jesus, not just the American church. I think that our issue globally as the church, as we've taken missionaries across the globe, is we try to Americanize them. And how many of you realize, you know one of the number one countries that need to be evangelized now and where missionaries are going? United States of America. I want to challenge us to lose the paradigm of religion. We've been feasting on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it's time to taste the tree of life. To see the purity of Christ. To live in a place surrendered to Jesus. Investing yourself into the scriptures. I promise you, the more you read in the scriptures, you're not going to see the American church. Let's stand. Lord, as we close out this short series on the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, I know that purposely and intently today, I was attempting to try to challenge our American Christianity. I'm asking now that the Holy Spirit would search our hearts. Even those of us that have strived to be good and we live according to the goodness of our heart of hearts, that you would search us. here today. Maybe you've been with us the last few weeks. Maybe today is your first time with us. But either way, 
If you hear, and the Spirit of God is challenging you in your heart. Should you have your Matthew 7 experience today, right now, standing before Jesus, what would be your outcome? And we're not going to follow that by encouraging the American paradigm of let's raise a hand and pray a prayer and walk forward. The challenge that Jesus gave is to make disciples. Jesus didn't issue a challenge that go to Judea and Samaria and to all the nations and make fans of Jesus. He didn't say go into all the third world nations and host rallies of thousands of people that they might walk forward and raise a hand. He said go and make disciples. People who choose to live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. To be clear that that's what we're talking about here, I just needed to articulate that. So if the Spirit of God has been challenging you over these last couple of weeks or even just today, I want to invite you to a moment of response just in your heart. Let me remind you, man looks on the outward, but God looks on the heart. Some people could raise a hand and walk forward, yet their heart be far from the Lord. He is looking right into the depth of who we are, right now. To the place of where intentions are born, into our hearts. And as we just worship for a few minutes, I want you to fellowship with Him there. As He searches you through and through. If he identifies an area of your life or life patterns or areas that aren't in line with him, won't you just submit them to him? Don't do as Adam and Eve did, as we talked about, conceal and hide and run and cover. Just come out in the open. Lord, I'm asking that in the next few minutes as we spend this intimate time with you, as you search us, you would break the bonds of religion you would break the stronghold of religion off of us. Break the desire in our hearts to impress the people around us. Break the desire for us to mimic the things we see because we want to look better. Break the desire of religion in us, God. I think of Mary of Bethany, who had an entire city that despised her and judged her but yet she came into a room of religious people that despised her act of worship. Yet Jesus said what she's done will be talked about for the remainder of history. She comes and she washes the feet of Jesus with her tears, dries them with her hair, anoints him with precious oil that costs an entire year's wage. That was worship. She wasn't consumed with people. She was consumed with him. Oftentimes, your authentic worship may become offensive to people around you. Don't be a man pleaser. Be a God pleaser. Oh, sacred King.